here at St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. Joining me in worship leadership this morning is our liturgist, Nita Heilman, and our pianist, Margaret Fisher. And also joining us in worship leadership today is each of you, because we know that together we worship the living God. As we prepare for worship this morning, I want you to know that whether this is your first time or you have been attending St. B for years, whether you are strong in your faith or you still have some questions, no matter your age, your tax bracket, your ability, or the color of your skin, no matter who you love or who loves you, you are welcome here. And it is a joy to worship with you. I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. God whispers to each of us, you are my beloved, created in love for love. Then let us gather, old and young, small and great, to dream God's dreams, receive God's power, and do God's deeds. Here we are, Lord, shining the light of your love on us, and the Lord your spirit within us. Lord, your redeeming will in us. Thank you, Lord. 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 I invite you now to join me as together we say our St. B. mission statement. Growing disciples of Christ for the transformation of our community. Good morning, St. B. Good morning. Welcome to those of you who are in here in person and to our Facebook friends who are worshiping with us online. Announcements, you and W will be meeting on October the 7th at 6.30. Interesting, the title of the study, Margaret, I just heard a gospel song on the radio coming in about Martha and Mary. Our charge conference, Ashley would probably be very happy with those of us that have to turn in charge conference forms if we got them in sooner rather than later. Uh, <laughs> The charge conference will be October 23rd at the province. Trump or Creek. We're going to try to have Trump or Creek this year after a year's absence. And you'll be seeing sign-up sheets about that later on. Uh, newsletters. If you do not get your newsletter by way of email, then the newsletters are in the narthex in the back. Uh, please remember to look through and pick yours up today. Are there any other announcements? I do have one. We are up to 116 children in the fuel program. Yes, so for all of you that have brought bags, keep bringing them. <laughs> it's gonna take a lot of bags, and we're having to double bag some of them because they have holes in them. Uh, so please continue to be faithful in bringing your bags and your contributions to the fuel program. Are there any other announcements? If not, then let us stand as you're able and join in the singing of our first hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory, page 577 in the Methodist hymnal and on the screen. Please stand as you're able.
Thank you. 
who is best friends with a rat named Olivia, and Ben and Dougie, a dog and a dolphin who can't get enough of each other. This is absolutely the wholesome content I search for every day of my life. Now I have to admit that our text today does not necessarily scream adorable animal friendships like I wish it did. This text in Mark does not immediately elicit warm feelings of friendship and community. Instead, we hear a story of exclusion. The disciples, having just been reprimanded by Jesus for arguing over who is the greatest, inform Jesus that someone who is not a disciple was casting out demons in Jesus' name. As Jesus responds, he expands upon his teaching from these previous verses as the disciples were arguing on their way to Capernaum. As we hear the gruesome details of removing body parts in order to avoid eternal damnation, we can't help but admit to the offensive nature of this text. We have to talk about the elephant in the room, whose best friend in this story is a worm that never dies. This text is hard to read or even conceptualize. As we read the cutting off of a hand or a leg or the gouging of eyes. Perhaps we can come to the same conclusion after we read this text. That we would like to keep all of our body parts. Within the text, we hear that these body parts should be removed if any causes one to stumble. In Greek, the word used is sandalizo. Even before we hear the definitions and context of its use in our text today, we can feel that it is much harsher than just to stumble. Its definitions include to put a stumbling block or impediment in the way upon which another may trip and fall. To cause a person to begin to distrust and desert one whom he ought to trust and obey. To be offended in one, i.e., to see in another what I disapprove of and what hinders me from acknowledging his authority. And to cause one to judge unfavorably or unjustly of another. These definitions cause us to reconsider what it means to remain on a path that causes us to stumble. It forces us to truly confront the things that divert us from our faith and discipleship. And as we widen our view of this text to be representative of not just ourselves, but also of our community, it gives us yet another punch in the gut. Is this text implying that we cut off members of our community or ourselves who do not meet our standard? At what point do we hear echoes of 1 Corinthians 12? The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. At what point do we commit to removing a member of our community? At what point, if any, does grace come in to play? Since early Christianity, there is danger in stark dualism of light and dark, good and bad, included and excluded. Yet we seem to be remarkably good at continuing to perpetuate this dualism. As per usual, it isn't difficult to see the division plaguing us. We hear from both sides of the aisle how evil the other side is. No one ever has anyone's best interest in mind. Both sides are causing the other to stumble. Both sides believe the other should be removed 
in order to live holier lives. We set up barriers and rules. Who can use what bathroom? Who is allowed to sit at the counter to eat? Who gets the best medical care? Who is allowed to get married? Who are they willing to sacrifice for the so-called good of the community? We are excellent at claiming provenient grace for ourselves. This provenient grace, this grace that goes before, this grace that is moving within us. But we often struggle to claim it for everyone else. Do we truly believe that God is working through all people, no matter our personal views of them, or just when we feel it lines up with our own understanding of the movement of the Holy Spirit? This text truly calls on us to examine our discipleship and our willingness to rid ourselves of things that get in the way of commitment to full discipleship. But in order to do this, we have to be willing to engage deeply with ourselves and our community. In his book, Heart and Mind, The Four Gospel Journey for Radical Transformation, Alexander Shire writes, Every time we attempt to avoid a situation, we only reduce our opportunity to grow, to learn from the journey. Like the immature disciples looking for a God who merely provides, we are, in fact, asking that God become smaller. Especially without help, the stresses of this path will cause many of us to make a choice to stop right now and return to what our protective brains and our fear thinks is a safe harbor. But stopping now comes at great cost, for this is the place where we will discover our level of commitment and our true willingness to rely on God's grace. There is deep beauty in the Gospel of Mark. In the midst of bleakness and despair, there is always imagery of hope and comfort. Jesus says to the disciples in verses 40 and 41, Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. Jesus is always destroying the boundaries that the, that the disciples attempt to impose. He says not to stop anyone who is using the power of Christ's name. It is clear that everything is unclear. There is no clear distinction about who is in and who is out, who is allowed to use Christ's name and who is not. That is, until Jesus makes things murkier with his response. It feels similar to when Jesus tells us that our mother and brother and sister is anyone who does the will of God. As we think about our community and who we think we're supposed to cut off, there is great relief in knowing that whoever gives you a cup of water because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. Jesus always redefines boundaries by not limiting who can receive the reward of the kingdom of God. And these boundaries are murky because we like to think we know exactly who is in and who is out. There is great hope in knowing that the person offering the water isn't held to the standard of who we think Christ is and who we think Christ includes. The good news of Christ and the kingdom of God is that the doors are flung wide open. 
This hope language continues through the body language in verses 42 through 50. By the time we get to verse 50, we are tired of hearing about chopping things off, otherwise we go to hell. We are ready for the good news of Christ's conclusion when he says, Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. We also know that 1 Corinthians 12 does not just say that members of the body are allowed to reject other members. It says, on the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Further, in yet another Pauline epistle we hear, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ. As we consider this text in the view of community, I invite you to return to the definitions of scandalizo particularly the ones that say to cause a person to begin to distrust and desert one whom he ought to trust and obey, and to cause one to judge unfavorably or unjustly of one another. While these definitions don't necessarily scream positivity, as we continue to explore the community as the body, we are reassured that together, we can lift one another up, remove stumbling blocks, and continue to remove barriers that separate us from Christ and from one another. In October 2015, National Geographic titled, published an article titled, Cheetah Dog Friendship Isn't As Strange As It Sounds. It opens by telling the story of Kumbali, the cheetah, and Keigo, the yellow Labrador retriever. Kumbali was not thriving in his mother's care after his mother had a litter of three. Bottle feeding by the zookeepers helped the kitten begin to grow and thrive, but there was still a social aspect missing from his care. The article says, Male cheetahs can be solitary and territorial, but often they'll group together with other males for support. Importantly, cheetahs in captivity can be easily agitated. You see, in captivity, their nervous energy has nowhere to go. And at the San Diego Zoo, there was great success in raising puppies and cheetah kittens together. Kumbali and Kato quickly became best friends, ignoring the dog, cat, predator, prey, oil, water dynamic that they were supposed to know about. Kato helped teach Kumbali social cues that Kumbali normally would have gotten from his mother and cheetah siblings. The article goes on to talk about the way dogs are also protecting cheetahs in parts of Africa. Farmers' entire livelihood is based on their livestock. And so when a cheetah would kill one of their animals, that was a huge financial loss. And so the farmers were killing the cheetahs. The Cheetah Conservation Fund, though, supplied specially bred dogs to be raised with the livestock to chase the cheetahs away before they got too close to the herds, before the farmers could get to them. And while this friendship clearly looks different than Kumbali and Kago, the dogs are still protecting the cheetahs. Community is at its best when we are willing to fully embrace one another. Community is at its best when we remove all barriers to distrust and judgment. Community is at its best when we recognize that there are different approaches to care for one another that aren't always obvious. 
Community is at its best when we are able to be inspired by unlikely animal friendships. Community is at its best when we remember open hearts, open doors, open minds. As we strive to embody these, we recognize that there are things that must be removed from ourselves and our community. But the things that are to be removed are not the beloved children of God. Instead, we need to strive to remove the barriers that separate us. White supremacy, racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, and any of this stark dualism that we see and experience. And the tools we use to remove those boundaries are accountability to God and to one another, an absolute abundance of grace, and a deep love for all of God's beloved children. In Christ, we are given the command and the strength to remove the parts of ourselves and our community that are causing us to stumble. In Christ, we are given the command and the strength to believe that provenient grace is working in all people, even if we cannot necessarily see the fruit. In Christ, we are given the command and the strength to love God and neighbor. In Christ, we are one and are called to be at peace with one another. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Lord, we're not perfect. We stumble. But you have called us by name, each one of us. And you pour grace upon grace upon grace upon us. Lord, make us one. Make us remember and be grateful for the blessings that you have given us. And now, Lord, we and we return a portion of your gifts to you for the use of your kingdom. In your son's name, amen.
As we come to our time of prayer this morning, we want to remember Chuck Schaefer. He's having a liver biopsy tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. at Tenova. Are there any other joys and concerns you would like to share with one another as a community? We want to remember Mission Guatemala, who lost one of their staff members this week to COVID. Are there any others? Yes. Um, my name is Renee Daniels Jones, and this is my home church, and I haven't been here in quite a while, and I'm so glad to be here with all, all of you, and I want you to know um, that that was one of the most beautiful sermons I ever heard. Thank you. Renee Daniel Jones is with us this morning, and this was her home church, and we are thrilled to have her and her husband with us this morning to worship with us. She was my next door neighbor and grew up with my children. She grew up with Patsy's children, and hopefully somebody was a good influence on the other. <laughs> Are there any other delays and concerns? Seeing that, let us go to God in prayer. Holy and loving God, you are in this space. And we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather once more together to worship your holy name. Oh God, we come before you carrying a great deal of things. Things that we have shared with one another and things that we carry in silence. But we know that you break through that silence. You break through our nervousness to share and pick up the load. For you are always with us. You always hear us. And there is nothing we can do that will separate us from your great love. Oh God, we lift up to you prayers for healing and nervousness in the midst of tests. We lift up to you our grief and sadness as we mourn the loss of people important to us. We offer up to you our joy of returning home. Oh God, we know that you are moving through the world, through our nation, through our community, through us. Attune us to your presence. Show us your grace and your love so that we may share that love and grace with all. For you have called us. You have called us to your service, and you have called us beloved. And as your beloved children, we pray together the prayer that Jesus first taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we
we come to the close of our service this morning, our closing hymn is Living for Jesus in the Faith We Sing, number 2149. You're invited to stand as you are able. <laughs>
friends, siblings in Christ. Siblings in Christ, we rejoice in the gifts that God has given us. And we rejoice in knowing that together we lift one another up and remove stumbling blocks that are put in our way. May we go forth from this place remembering the call that Jesus has placed on our lives. And so go in peace. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen.